I'm going to start while people are still coming in. Um, I welcome, I'm Heather Bendari, adjunct lecturer in visual art, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to our third artist lecture of this school year. Um, I'm thrilled to introduce you tonight to Jeffrey Gibson. Before we get to his talk, I'd like to begin with the fact that though we find ourselves in shared common digital space, I know I'm thinking a lot more deeply about the physical space that I occupy and quite literally the ground that I occupy. So I want to acknowledge that I'm coming to you from the unceded land of the Muncie Lenape that right now we refer to that as Brooklyn and that the List Art Center where the department is located sits on the occupied indigenous lands of the Narragansett and the Wampanoag people. If you don't know which land you occupy and you want to look it up, you can go to native-land.ca. It's a really amazing website that I highly recommend. Uh, we note too that we are connected by a campus that relied on the African slave trade in the Americas and that there are buildings on campus constructed by enslaved people. These acknowledgements commit us to a lifetime of anti-racist work. I'd like to thank Leslie Bostrom, the Chair of Visual Arts, Christine Dodd, Alanda Estrada, Sean Tavares, Gregory Picard, and BAI for helping to bring us all together to talk about these things, acknowledge these things, and to share information, have great conversations. Um, a few more things to note is that we kindly ask that you refrain from recording this event yourself. A recording of the talk will be available through the Brown Visual Arts Department very soon. If you'd like to sc take screenshots, go right ahead. Just please remember to tag at Brown Visual Art and at Jeff Rune, which is Jeffrey Gibson's Instagram. That's J-E-F-F-R-U-N-E. -E. Second, after Jeffrey's presentation, there'll be ample time for Q&A. So please type questions into the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen, and I will ask the questions on your behalf. It's expected that everyone will be curious, kind, and respectful when asking questions. And finally, though we cannot see you, we know you're there, we welcome you. So hello to all of you out there and thank you for sharing this time with us. Now I get to uh, introduce Jeffrey Gibson, who is an extremely well-respected member of the art community as a maker and as a person. He makes work that connects craft, art historical and pop culture influences in ways that I had not seen previously. It's very rare to read about an artist whose work is described with, in, with such words as rave, punk rock, modernism, indigenous craft work, and ancient abstraction all in the same sentence. Those who've worked with him have a huge smile on their face when they talk about him, and his work, while personal and stunningly beautiful, has universal appeal and deep referential underpinnings. Jeffrey Gibson is a 2019 MacArthur Genius Grant winner. His work combines Native American tradition with the visual languages of modernism to explore the contemporary confluence of personal identity, culture, history, and international social narratives. Jeffrey is a member of the Choctaw and Cherokee nations. He, li he currently lives and works in Hudson, New York. One of his most recognized series involves punching bags that Jeffrey, Jeffrey deftly transforms into aesthetic totems. Another of Jeffrey's long running series involves an examination of transformational garments. A sec a selection of these garments was exhibited in the 2019 Whitney Biennial, which maybe some of you saw. Jeffrey's work is included in the collections of the Smithsonian Institution, the Whitney Museum of Art, SF MoMA, the Denver Art Museum, the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, the Nerman Museum of Contemporary Art, among many others. Recent exhibitions include When Fire is Applied to a Stone at Cracks at the Brooklyn Museum, Can You Feel It at Kavi Gupta Chicago, She Never Dances Alone at Times Square Arts, this is the day at the Blanton Museum um, in Austin, Texas, the anthropophagic effect at the New Museum in New York, and like a hammer at the Denver and Seattle Art Museums. So please join me in welcoming Jeffrey Gibson in whatever way you can through a screen. Thank you so much, Jeffrey, for coming, and I will turn the Zoom over to you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Heather. Um, and welcome to all of you to this Zoom talk. Um, and I'm really grateful to be here. It is a bit odd to do a talk through Zoom, but I'm doing a lot of Zoom calls lately. And I'm sure um, we'll get through this with no problems. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Um, let's see. Here we go. Um, so it's, yeah, I think, I don't know if I've actually done a talk on Zoom yet, um, you know, to, to students. It's such a strange time. And I'll just start by saying, 
have a lot of um, kind of mediated anxiety about this time and uh, this week and leading up to the election. And so, um, and especially during a global pandemic and all of the uh, movements towards um, civil justice and equity justice. And so, um, so I'm sure some of that will come into this. Um, as COVID started, and I'm gonna show you some video later in the talk, which um, was on March 7th. So it was literally almost like the day that some of the places around here started um, shutting down. Certainly by the 14th, everything had shut down. Um, and I've continued working this whole entire time which um, I think is, was, was challenging, continues to be challenging to think that coming into the studio and continuing to make artwork is the most obvious thing to continue doing. In retrospect, I'll say that um, I think it was the right thing to do for me. And I'm, I'm really happy with a lot of the things that we've made as a way of kind of focusing myself and grounding myself during this time period and kind of documenting what it's been like. Um, some of some of what I think helped me a lot was to look back at my work over the past, you know, seven, eight years and see that a lot of these conversations for me are not new. There are things that I've been referencing, but during this kind of heightened political time, you know, the context that we all are living in has shifted things in a way that the work also takes on um, slightly new meanings or, or you know, bigger meanings or amplifies the messages that were already there. So um, that's been something that has been um, interesting to, to experience. So I'm going to start with this piece. Um, this piece is a, one of the punching bags. Um, this is not the first punching bag. This punching bag um, came about, I believe, in 2016. Um, and you can see the, the paintings that are on the um, the bag itself, those were uh, paintings that I made when I first came to New York out of graduate school. And I moved to New York in 1999. And then those paintings ultimately began to feel very much like, um, kind of like the weight of failure of being an artist, trying to establish myself as an artist in New York. And those paintings would go out and come back. And, um, you know, they go out with lots of dreams and hopes and they would come back and feel very much like a failure, like rejection. So those paintings I took off of the stretchers, um, I would take them to a local laundromat and wash them until they kind of softened. Um, sometimes the, the surface of the painting would really shift because it's um, sometimes oil paint on top of cotton canvas, which would shrink. Um, so I had those around um, and um, this bag says people like us. Um, it was a time and every now and again, you know, I'll really restrict my color palette. This was definitely what I wanted to make was a red bag um, and red referring to um, to the idea of the red skin Indian or um, just to think of ourselves as the red people. Um, even in, in Choctaw language, uh, Huma means uh, two things. It means red and it also means the people. So, um, so people like us is a phrase that um, I actually, I first came across in a Sister Karita Kent print that um, hangs in my home um, that says people like us. And it's a set of words that I really respond to because I feel like whoever is looking at those words can project their own community into what people like us might mean or represent. Um, this is another what I kind of think of as like a monochromatic bag. This was the white bag. Um, and on this bag, the words say white power. And I knew when, and this is also probably from about 2016, 2015, 2016. You know, I knew when I was making this bag that um, it was going to be beautiful because um, oftentimes in our culture, in American culture and Western culture, beauty is attributed to white. And I don't just mean white skin, but I mean, you know, the christening gown, the wedding dress, the fresh coat of paint on a wall, things that mark kind of a new beginning and a freshness and beauty. And so I knew that the words white power for me were charged, but I also knew that they would kind of have a counterplay with the beauty of this object and really the desire to want to look at it. Um, and that sort of 
marks a couple of things for me. One about the, the my use of language and my interest in language and text, but also in beauty, which is something that um, certainly during my time in undergrad, the idea of beauty was something which was very much um, seen as uh, almost not having the ability to contain serious content. And so that's driven a lot of my choices is to try to find ways to have content infused into beautiful objects or into use beauty almost as a tool to bring people in. Um, this is one of the very first figures that came about. And, um, you know, a lot of my materials, I am a collector of things. I collect everything from stones. Uh, in here, I see beetle wings. I see, you know, garments and punk t-shirts. And sometimes I'll buy a pair of shoes just to have them around as objects. Um, rawhide. There's also repurposed blankets in this piece. And um, it was the idea to want to take these materials that I actually am aware of and I know about, but to try to transform them into something that was not specifically, uh, wasn't specific to any, any tribal nation, any First Nation. And um, so, you know, this kind of idea of this fetishistic figure coming from another place, another time, another world was what I was hoping to achieve with these. And I'm very fond of these initial figures. This is the first one. And, and um, on the pants in on the shoulders here are, um, jingles and going back hundreds of years at this point back into the late 16 and early 1700s those jingles would have been the the lids of tobacco and snuff containers which would have been discarded and then were collected by um, indigenous people turned into cones that um, ultimately by the early 1900s late 1800s becomes a um a dance that's gendered called the jingle dress dance um it, is an Anishinaabe tradition, and um, and the the cones are now commercially produced. And so, for me, initially, it was really about this idea of something that could have been thrown away as garbage, but was transformed into something that today um, can be spoken about as being a ceremonial, culturally specific healing dance. But for me, it's really about that material and somebody choosing to take it from one context, put it into their own context and find a way to transform and use it to support themselves. Um, with this particular piece, I was thinking a lot about, you know, the kind of club culture and club kid culture of the late eighties. Um, and that idea of being able to kind of dress up. Um, there was lots of questionable ways of dressing up, but there was also lots of amazing things that people did. I also wanted to work with body shape so that this figure here, um, I don't consider them gendered, but I wanted to play with a kind of fat body um, as a kind of uh, body representation um, to diversify body representation. And you can see compared to this first one is quite different. And just to give you a sense, here's sort of like the, the boot of this figure. Um, I don't plan them out entirely from the beginning. They kind of come together in bits and pieces. And I think most of the work that I'm showing you here has all been made um, with uh, a studio team. So since about 2012, I have worked with a studio team that I employ here. And so, you know, we can kind of um, see things develop and process. Not all the decisions need to be made up front. This is a more recent figure. They've gotten quite a bit taller. Those previous ones were probably around 30 inches tall. And this one probably gets up to about 48 inches tall. So they've actually gotten quite a bit higher, quite a bit taller. And you can see that materials, I really just try to think about, you know, I will sample from earlier pieces, but I also try to think about how to, you know, here, bring it onto the head. Um, we've learned a lot in the studio, how to make patterns for shapes out of the beadwork. And this kind of fringing, um, you know, you wouldn't really ever see this much fringe on anything in terms of like a, a dance regalia at a powwow. So it really has shifted the way, you'd never see jingles like this either. This is not any sort of traditional way of using jingles. Um, so I feel like I get a lot of freedom from thinking about these, these figures. Um, so, 
I think from there, you know, my interest in the figure was also about the textiles and, you know, having grown up going to museums and seeing different indigenous textiles hanging on the wall, much like paintings, you know, maybe they were originally ceremonial robes, they still are ceremonial robes that had been um, taken from the communities that they were made within. And I realized that these robes, what's amazing about them to me is that they're transformational. When you put this robe on, you become somebody different. You, you think differently, you behave differently, you move differently. So with these sculptures, I wanted the figure to basically be the robe. Um, and so the armature underneath is from repurposed um, teepee poles um, and rawhide. And this was part of the beginning of me beginning to work with clay. So that head there is, is made from clay. And this is probably a little over, probably around six feet tall. Um, here's a detail. This is also the first time, um, I'll talk a little bit about Mississippian culture later, but my attraction to clay really came from um, what's referred to as Mississippian head pots, which are these small clay heads that initially people really assume had something to do with funerary, um, funerary ceremonies, but ultimately we don't really know what the heads were for. I wanted to have these kind of um, traumatized heads with these orifices that weren't just nostrils and mouths, but also sort of gouged eyes and holes in the head. And I imagine these as these sort of ancestral figures that have been walking the earth for hundreds of years. And the text on this one says, um, can't take my eyes off of you. And here's the back of it. So again, this kind of fringe, this kind of um, beadwork, this kind of jingling is not anything that you would ever see traditionally. This would really be very counter to movement in terms of how people dance and move. Um, but, and this was before I even began, you know, um, seeing what it was like to have people wear the garments, but that was the beginning of it. This is one of the first wall hangings, what we want, what we need. Um, and it was made, um, it was actually, there's a couple of things going on. One, as an educator, I was helping to facilitate conversations around Black Lives Matter, but, um, but also um, I had gone to Winnipeg in Canada and um, it was really shocking to me the amount of uh, people, Indigenous people who I met who had lost somebody or who had a missing family member and really learned much more about the missing and murdered Indigenous women's movement. And so this um, piece, what we want, what we need, and it's not specifically about that. There's another piece that I made about um, missing and murdered Indigenous women. But um, this particular piece, when this song, um, it's probably before many people's time, but is from Public Enemies Fight the Power, um, which really kind of erupted um, as an anthem during the Rodney King beating when, all, when that was in the 90s, um, when the media was, was focused on that. And so it just kind of, you know, made me understand how little had changed in many ways. And even now, um, in terms of police brutality and the treatment of Black, Indigenous, and people of color um, by institutions generally, not just the police, but that sort of awakening to the kind of um, how often it happens and, and having to kind of come to understand how I feel about it or how I, how I um, yeah, how I respond to it. Um, this piece is about 12 feet wide. Um, all of the fringe is, this is wool that's been cut into a checkerboard pattern. Um, these are all deaccessioned uh, arrowheads from a museum collection. And then there's also small amulets and things that I wore in high school, you know, as like charms or bracelets or on necklaces. This is another wall hanging. Um, this one is a quote by James Baldwin and it says, American history is longer, larger, more beautiful and more terrible than anything anyone has ever said about it. And, um, you know, these initially, you know, just to go to the question or the, the ideas about craft, I was so nervous when I made these because I did think, I was like, I'm trained as a painter. Like, what am I doing thinking about making wall hangings? Like that just seemed like the wrong direction to go in. But ultimately, um, I think the beadwork, the textiles, the kind of scale of it, this is about, um, I think it's about a hundred inches tall. 
um, began to shift it into something that it wasn't just a comfortable textile that sits on the wall and um, is just there to be looked at and be beautiful. Um, James Baldwin is somebody who I have looked at since I was a teenager, um, mainly because he was a person of color and because he was gay. And um, I grew up moving around quite a bit. So I lived in Europe and I lived in Korea before I moved back to the United States as a teenager. And I think the idea of what it means to be American, what it means to make work here um, and try to deal with these histories that exist here on this continent, um, in this country. Um, you know, James Baldwin is somebody who really, if you, if you read and kind of follow his interviews and his writings, it, the spectrum is so wide and, and I feel like it offers so much in terms of articulating the complexity of what it's like to be a person of color in this country. Um, so this is a beaded wall hanging. These are approximately 40 inches tall by 30 inches wide. Um, I think about them a lot, a lot like posters. Um, and I started thinking much more graphically about how design and pattern work and how to play with text and language um, within things. When I made this piece, The Only Way Out is Through, I was definitely, um, you know, feeling general anxiety about being a person of color in this country and um, being a queer person of color in this country and just questioning my kind of stability and safety and, and what determines that. Um, and so the only way out is through was something that I came across and, you know, I'm always collecting words. And then later on, some many people, in fact, who have come through addiction programs have told me that this is a piece that speaks to them because just that kind of continual reminder to stay on track and to just kind of continue. So this is the piece that I was talking about that I made um, thinking about the missing and murdered indigenous women. And um, by this point I had used a lot of um, song lyrics as a way to kind of articulate my own feelings. This one I wanted to imagine that there was a protest and we're seeing a view from above of people in like a square. So trying to think about like how design can also like hold content and especially a beaded pattern. Um, and the text in Numbers Too Big to Ignore is from Helen Reddy's I Am Woman, Hear Me Roar. And, um, and it's just, again, words that I feel like, I feel like this for me, especially because the jingles are gendered um, and where they come from, they are very representative of indigenous women. Um, and with these words, thinking about missing and murdered indigenous women is, um, to me, it just sort of holds it all together in one piece, which is what I hope to do. Um, like I said, I'm trained as a painter. Um, these are quite, uh, they're, I think each panel is probably about 18 inches square, 17 by 18. Um, and I wanted to do these diptychs and you'll see diptychs are something that have, I've kind of returned to numerous times. Um, they're painted on rawhide stretched over wood. The rawhide is deer um, and I love working on rawhide for a couple of reasons. One, it is a beautiful material to work on. It has like almost zero resistance, but I also love that it's very different from ubiquitous canvas. And so even though they're painted exactly the same, but in reverse, um, they are completely different paintings, yet because of the composition, they complete each other. So this one to me was playing around with the idea of a landscape that completes itself, but what you see in the hide, in particular in the one on the right, is um, this is discoloration in the skin of the deer but, and bruising, but also you see um, scratches and scrapes and um, um, welts in the skin. And so in person, oftentimes, you know, you'll see even things like hair follicles and um, pores in the flesh. And so ultimately, you know, I do want people to enjoy the beauty of the painting, but also to realize that you really are looking at something. Um, it positions the viewer for them to realize that they're looking at the hide of an animal. And also, at the time, I really did want to um, kind of be contextualized by the history of indigenous painting and what those materials have been. So here's another diptych. Um, these are actually two hand drums. So these are um, two drums. These are deer hide also over a wood frame, um, very much inspired by Felix Gonzalez Torres. And um, 
the two, the double clock and very similar um, in the idea that even though they're painted identically, right? They're painted at the same time using the exact same paint. There's no way they will ever be the same painting because of the hide. The hide is always going to have its own markings and you can see it there in the blue and in the yellow, even in the red, um, they will always be different. And so it's kind of amazing because when these are being made in the studio, um, they will always be drums, right? You still wanna pick them up and beat them. But once you put them in a frame, it's amazing to me how much they begin to refer to both formalism, modernism. But again, it's that hide that like brings you back into a present place where you're like, oh, this is not, these are not round canvases and this just isn't about um, formalism. This is a, um, a full, um, full deer hide that has been stretched. It hangs um, unstretched, unframed. And this is just to give a sense about, you know, this started off as a um, experiment, just wanting to work with one glaze. So there's some areas in here where there's like 30 glazes and that's how you get that really deep, deep, deep brown. Um, and there's some places where there is no glaze and other places where there's just one layer of glaze. And glazing is something that I tend to do. It works really well with hide because hide itself is, um, has a thickness and is translucent. So when you glaze on top of it, the light literally is able to move in and out of the paint. And here I just wanted to play with geometry and play with a, um, you know, a, an organic shape that um, trying to find a way, like how would I describe this through, through geometry? This is another full hide piece. This is also a full deer hide. Um, these are actually brass, copper and steel um, an iron uh, upholstery tacks that have been made to kind of radiate around this full hide. This is canvas over wood panel um, and then the hide is on its own canvas and has been nailed down um, and the text is from um, Kate Bush from um, the song, hold on now I'm spacing, um, Woman's Work. Um, which is a song that I've always um, listened to probably also since I was a teenager. Um, and so the text says, I know you have a lot of strength left. And um, I wanted to highlight just because of a different color that says I have strength left. So ultimately, you know, between the punching bags, the figures, the sculptures, it was time for me to think about, and, and also a lot of the talks I was having at the time, people would ask me about, you know, what do jingles sound like? Like, what does the fringe move like? Do you ever put these on? Like, I was really drawing from a lot of performative and dance um, contexts. So I finally decided that I wanted somebody to move in something. Um, so this is the first garment that the studio made and it was made for me. Um, I did a performance as, as part of um, Sight Santa Fe in 2016. Um, and that video um, shows me wearing this garment. This garment weighs about 130 pounds. And so it was a durational endurance performance where it, about an hour and a half and trying to move and lift my arms and to write the words on the drawings in the back just really began to, you could see in the video, my arms shaking because it's like, I'm just so tired. My legs are tired. Um, I'm playing the drum. And it was really, um, it was intuitive movement um, based on the movements of the animals that you see in the back. So a horse, a butterfly, a rabbit, a fox. And those are the movements that I make. And it was really me wearing the garment that I began to realize that the garments make you almost feel more present because you can't move so freely. So you have to really consider how you move. And there's also the sensation that you make sound when you move. There's the sensation of what it feels like to have this kind of weight on your arm and to feel the fringe move and, and kind of brush against the floor. So that kind of started, um, I've always had an interest in performance, although I'm so shy and nervous about performance that particular piece was just really a challenge for me to do. And that's almost why I did it. And um, we actually ended up shooting it and it exists as a video and an installation. Um, this is a more recent punching bag. This is from 2016 titled Love is the Drug. Um, and on the surface, there are just a huge collection of different hearts, 
Um, and love and relationships is something that I come back to um, again and again and again. And, you know, I think ultimately, you know, there's the, the idea of love is something that I think when you're a queer person, when you're from um, a community that's not central to the narrative of the United States or to, um, to a kind of grand Western narrative, love and those relationships with your community and with those people who support you it really is a political act. Um, and it's something that, you know, oftentimes I, I want to think that it's not, I want to step away from that idea, but ultimately when it comes down to it, you know, and, and being a parent now, I really realize it, it continues to be um, political. And I don't, I don't do those things to be political, but I have to realize that, you know, my relationship, my parenting, um, my teaching, it is definitely political. So, um, so this was that piece and, and um, you know, something as simple as like a heart. I was obsessed with hearts for a long time. I was collecting all of these charms and um, to put the heart into the beadwork. So this is a wall hanging from 20, let me see, this would be 20, I believe 18, 2017 or 18. Um, and this was kind of, you know, a little frightening for me because um, this is a trading post textile. And part of it came about because people would come into my studio and I, you know, I collect lots of things and lots of kinds of weavings and textiles and people, non-native people would come into the studio and want to project that every textile had ceremonial purpose. And, you know, I would say, no, 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 that's not true. You know, like I, first of all, I would never collect a ceremonial textile. And um, these are actually, um, they were commissioned by trading post owners for weavers. And those weavers were weaving these for sale um, to the public in order to support their families. So, um, you know, those are the ones that I feel comfortable with. And I um, have drawn a lot in terms of this kind of, um, kind of optical psychedelia, this kind of patterning from these particular eye dazzler weavings, which is what they're referred to as eye dazzler. And they were seen as kind of a more modern weaving looking at the early 20th century. So most of these are gonna be from like the 40s. Um, you can still find them. They tend to almost have been overproduced in some areas. And so you can still find some that have not seen the light of day. Also my grandfathers were both Southern Baptist ministers um, in Oklahoma and in Mississippi. So I do oftentimes look towards hymns. I look, I look at the Bible a lot for words. Um, and so this is uh, lyrics from Amazing Grace, and it says, "'Tis grace that has brought me this far, and grace will lead me home." And in the center, from um, soul to soul, back to life, back to reality. And just to give you a sense of what happens. So technically, you know, looking at this, um, each thing really happens in piecework. Um, and none of it really happens, you know, this was not a vision from the beginning. It's things that really come together bit by bit. Here's another wall hanging, my eyes have seen you. Um, and then it's hard to see, but on the left and the right, it says your words, um, your words mesmerize me, sorry. Um, so it's ribbon work in the back. There's also a, um, a trading post weaving, bead work, and then fringe. Um, and then the bag on the right um, is a quote from Audre Lorde that actually, in fact, I've, um, I've used again, but um, it ends with nothing is eternal, which is the title of the piece. And so this is from 20, 2018. And by that point, you know, we had been using fringe for a while and I wanted to see, I wanted to push it further. So we started cutting into the fringe to make these kind of geometric shapes. Um, and so that's, you know, one of the great things about being able to do everything in this building, which is where I'm at now is in the studio. Um, this was a show at Sikkima Jenkins, that last image and this image. And so last night a DJ saved my life is the bag on the right. Um, which is steel studs, um, glass beads, jingles, and fringe. Um, and on the left is a seven panel painting that is I Am a Rainbow 2. And I Am a Rainbow 2 is, um, the lyrics are from um, Bob Marley's um, The Sun is Shining. And those I really did want to specifically reference 
the Roy G. Biv Rainbow um, for this show, which was titled I Am a Rainbow Too. I really wanted to focus on that idea of the LGBTQ plus rainbow, um, which is something that I think at the time, you know, during the 90s, for instance, when I was, at, you know, in my early 20s and late teens, I really um, didn't want to identify with myself as like a rainbow wearing kind of queer guy. But then in my 40s, realizing how powerful that statement of unity really is and how often it's been used historically. And so it was kind of like trying me trying to like gain some comfortability with this um, use of the rainbow. And I, I really do love this painting. Um, and so that's all the letters. By this point, I had also um, developed these letter forms that are all, um, I don't know if you can see them, but they basically repeat and then through glazing the color shifts and there are slight uh, small beaded frames on these. This is a much larger painting. I think this is about 81 inches tall. Um, and this was from the same exhibition from 2018. So the frames are um, have a beaded beaded panels inset into the perimeter of the frame. Um, and this one says, there are times when I feel you smile upon me. Um, and that's from a Janet Jackson song. And so the idea of going back through like my kind of discography, of, like not music that I've produced, but music that I've listened to and have um, again, many times reminded me of loving relationships, many times reminded me of heartbreak, of sadness, of happiness. Um, I began going through and like, what are these songs that I continue to return to and listen to? Um, these are acrylic on canvas and then uh, a custom frame with the beadwork inset. Here's another one, I Do Not Want What I Haven't Got, which is Sinead O'Connor. Amazing album that just got me through years and years and years of uh, trying to figure stuff out. Um, and, you know, so these, these letter forms I continue to use today. Um, I have just recently commissioned an indigenous graphic designer to um, create a font for me that is uh, very exciting to me. Um, to kind of develop a font that is specifically about my work and my practice and um, something that we'll be able to use, you know, I can type letters in it and, you know, I'll have a real font, which is very exciting. This is a, um, a painting that I'm kind of returning to now. This is a painting also from 2018 titled Trouble Don't Last Always. And, you know, I returned to painting um, mainly because, you know, with Hyde, for instance, Hyde, you can work quite in a, on an intimate scale, but it is really difficult once you start working at a much larger scale. The hide is really um, challenging to work with. It has a mind of its own. It's incredibly strong and it can, um, it can pull things apart. Um, so if you keep it small, you tend to be able to work with it better. And I wanted to work in this kind of like, almost like quilt block way in terms of painting. And these are also not planned out entirely. They happen in these blocks. So I almost think about it as like one painting next to another painting, bisected that, another small painting. And that's really how the painting comes together over time. And then the, the text panel in the bottom, um, Trouble Don't Last Always, is um, our words taken from a sermon. So the garments, um, Tracy Adler at the Welland Museum um, invited me to do a large solo exhibition and she asked me about fashion and she said, you know, do you pay attention to fashion? And I said, I do pay attention to fashion, um, mainly for the kind of artisanal handcraft element of couture. And um, we started talking about like, um, you know, what was my interest? And I said, well, really, you know, the hand indigenous handcraft has never been put on the same kind of value level as European couture um, artisanal handcraft. And I just wanted to put them side by side. But ultimately it led to thinking about making garments um, that could almost suspend these kind of transformational garments and think about people wearing them or could they be performed in or how would they function? Um, I was looking at a couple of things. One of them was a ghost dance shirt, which the ghost dance movement, which continues today, was um, started by a self-proclaimed prophet named Wovoka. And um, this is again at the end of the 1800s, end of the 1800s, yes. 
And um, so his claim was that if you made this shirt and you, you danced and you prayed in the shirt that it would protect you from the white man's bullets. And at the time, and I've known about it for a long time, but I really thought, um, you know, to kind of what we wear attracts kinds of attention to us. Um, and those, the, the, that attention sometimes can be violent, that intention can be loving. Um, but I wanted to make garments that were about who I am and about the messages that I'm paying attention to. Um, they're quite large. Some of these that you're looking at are about 10 to 11 feet tall. <clears throat> Some of them are extremely heavy. Um, they were all made here in the studio. A lot of it was learning along the way. There was lots of failures along the way. There were also helmets that I imagined, these kind of like warriors wearing both the garments and the helmets. Ultimately, I felt like the helmets worked better as their own independent sculptures. Um, some of them are quite heavy. They weigh about 30 to 40 pounds each. Um, and we, I did ask people to wear them um, and we have some documentation of that, but ultimately um, it's very challenging to move in it. So this is um, Shanika McIntosh who lives here in Hudson. Um, I do try to work with, um, I, try, I, I tend to return to a lot of the same people to work with. I don't know if you remember this figure. This is the one that I referred to as the fat body figure earlier in the talk. I had it printed on a really large scale and it became the front of this garment um, with sequins and you can see the jingles in print and then you see the jingles in person on her chest. Um, and there was something that was just so, um, this this was this photograph was not taken by me. I was on set for these photographs, and I really would basically direct people to move in them. But um, this garment is quite tall, so um, I don't think her feet are even seen. We had to have her stand on a block. Um, but these photographs really started me thinking about what it means to photograph somebody wearing these garments. This is um, Henry Williams, who actually works in the studio, and um, I Henry is kind of. I don't know, Henry is somebody who makes me laugh, but he's also quite got a good dark, dark sense of humor. Um, this particular helmet is the clown helmet. It's all of these vintage clown um, dolls and toys and brooches. And the clown is something that I've also referred to numerous times. Um, I think the clown actually has a lot of integrity. I see the clown as an intellectual, but the clown also can kind of, there are many kinds of cultural clowns. But the clown also, people don't take seriously, much like adornment and decor. Um, they sometimes fail to see it as having a kind of um, critical perspective on the world. So that is sort of my love of the role of the clown. Um, and I love this image of Henry. And these photographs were taken by Caitlin Mitchell um, for the uh, Wellen Museum catalog. This is the love helmet. This is Anana who lives here in Hudson also. Um, all of the beadwork was done here in the studio, the vintage quilts, I'm a quilt collector. Um, sometimes we'll just use quilt tops. Um, this helmet probably does weigh about 40 pounds. It's a huge piece of amethyst crystal on top of the head um, and then all of these um, hearts. Um, this is an installation shot from the anthropophagic effect at the new museum and Anthropophagy is something that I probably was introduced to, my gosh, I'm gonna say early 2000s, um, through um, a Brazilian surrealist group and the Cannibalist Manifesto, which was at the time very much about the way of cultural survival was exactly to allow influences to come in, but then to immediately turn them into something that supported your own culture, rather than being colonized by the influences coming in. And so um, that's where the title came from. And this is how I wanted to work with these materials. I also wanted to shift the materials to something more natural. So you see um, paragords from the Southeast, which is where my um, tribe is from, Mississippi. Um, and then these printed fabrics of people who have come into the studio and I've done photo shoots with them wearing the, um, the garments in front of other artworks of mine. So I kind of think of them almost as like documents of my own history. Um, 
the helmets on the right, these were actually meant to be worn, but I wanted to work with basketry reed with river cane. So this is um, that installation. These are the helmets. And um, we did bring someone in um, from Wisconsin to um, work with us to teach me really how to make baskets. So everyone in the studio learned how to make baskets. And then it was amazing as a sculptural material that these, you can just continue building upon um, weaving. Here's a detail of one of the one of the garments. Here's another detail. So what you see at the top there is actually birch bark um, that has been soaked and stitched down. And so we just chose the natural different colors of the birch bark to create this kind of op art effect. And then of course, pair gourds. This is the front of one of the garments. This is um, basketry reed. Um, which what you see in the back there is a, a performer who I've worked with before. Um, at the time, their partner uh, in front of paintings of mine that um, we titled this print, The Anthropophagic Effect, and, um, and then the reed hanging over top of it. So part of the anthropophagic effect at the new museum was to bring people in and to photograph them. And ideally, I was asking for indigenous people of color, queer people to come in and let me photograph them. And, you know, a lot of the garments have found their ways into museum collections at this point. And I love the fact that we have documentation of people having worn the garment um, before, you know, I can't, I don't know if I'll ever be able to put anyone in that garment again. But um, this is Roxy Romero, who um, I've worked with a couple of times since then. Um, this is almost at the beginning of us meeting and getting to know each other and just she just we had a fluorescent yellow painted wall and she just happened to have fluorescent yellow nails and I think this image is just um, it's one of my favorite images and these are taken by me. Um, this is one of the supporters of the project and I apologize I can't remember her name at the moment but um, she was an incredible jewelry collector and I asked her to come in and um, would she let me photograph her in her jewelry in the garment? So again, this is a photograph taken by me and her wearing one of the helmets. And we would literally just, we would, we would do it while the public was there, but we would, um, we had like a small corner that had sort of like a, um, a seamless wall and um, we would photograph right in the space. This is the photograph of MX Oops and Xavier Ryan um, wearing the garments that you saw hanging in the Welland exhibition. Um, and uh, actually all of us have continued working together in some form. So, um, so um, part of the, you know, when with, I was working with Johanna Burton at the new museum and she asked me about programming and I said, you know, I would love to do um, a performance. Um, and so <clears throat> MX and I had known each other for a while and MX teaches voguing in the city. And um, he introduced me to Jason Rodriguez who is from the house of Balenciaga and they brought in um, somebody, another dancer, I can't remember their name right now from the house of Mugler came in and I really just gave them the garments, handed them over and I said, you know, you guys choreograph, you do your thing. We brought in Laura Ortman to improvise with music. And um, so this is a very, very brief clip of what turned out to be about a half hour performance. So um, that was really kind of amazing to me to see people um, just literally like, you know, take over and they, everybody was concerned about the garment, you know, what happens if it falls off, what happens if it rips, you know, and I love being able to say to people like, it's fine, you know, we can repair it, we made it, we can repair it. Um, and I love that they're getting used before they actually just become untouchable art objects. And, um, so this is um, a painting from 2019 from the show at Kavi Gupta. Um, and this continued this letter form paintings. She knows other worlds. 
Um, and this is acrylic on canvas with a beaded frame as well. This is also probably about um, 81 inches tall, I believe, with frame. This is a piece that's in the, um, the Brooklyn exhibition right now, and it is the title piece. Um, so when fire is applied to a stone, it cracks. Um, and you know, it was really the title that I wanted to call the show. I remember when we were having conversations, I was like, look, I know this is a really long title. It's a lot of words, but it is the exact sentiment that um, I want the title to express. And ultimately we decided to, to stick with it and go with it. Um, it is um, an unattributed Irish, um, attributed to being Irish, but not to an individual um, saying. And it really is like, you know, for me, it was about these kind of antiqui antiquated ideas about indigeneity, what that looks like, where it comes from, what it sounds like. And I wanted to um, work on this project with the Brooklyn Museum to try to be very transparent about where my references are coming from um, within historic collections. And so um, hopefully in that process, it was about also opening it up, um, not just for understanding, but also for critique, you know, which I think is, is hugely important for conversations around indigeneity to, to grow. Um, this was also from the Kavi Gupta show, um, Before the Devil Knows You're Dead. And um, so these paintings, um, it's interesting seeing them now, you know, like they're so graphic. The whole idea was for them to be so crisp and so hard edge and really about color and shape, um, really bold and loud. And then I think about the paintings that I'm working on now, which are much more um, painterly for lack of a better word, but to, to try to like bring those surfaces into conversation with each other. And here's just a, an example of what the side looks like. Um, quilts um, emerged out of um, the fabrics for the garments. I also have a love of quilts. I, I collect quilts. I think of um, May building a painting very much in a quilt way. So um, it just made sense to just kind of let's make a quilt and see what happens. And ultimately, I fell in love with them. These um, were started from the scraps. Um, also, you can see there's that, uh, what I call the fat body figure. Again, there's other figures that have been in here. Um, there's the anthropophagic effect um, image of Xavier and MX. Um, yeah, so it's almost just like there's one of the larger figures um, speak to me so that I can understand. Um, and you'll see the fabric that says they teach love. You'll see that um, in, in another slide here. This is what it looks like up close. And we work with a local um, quilter named Robert Bemis. And um, Robert lives in Troy, New York. And he's somebody who, um, I just looked at his quilting and I said, you know, what do you think? Do you wanna try this? And he is totally a collaborator in this. I don't tell him what to do. We literally hand over the quilt top. We assemble the quilt top here and then we hand it over and I give him free reign to do whatever he wants to do to the quilt. Um, and it's interesting seeing what his choices are because they definitely emerge from our conversations. Um, if you're trapped in the dream of the other, you're fucked, um, is a quote from Jules Deleuze, who is also just a huge influence on me in terms of thinking. Um, I teach one class now at Bard and it is based on the book, The Fold by Jules Deleuze. Um, that's a whole other conversation, but <laughs> it's been a very influential thinker and writer for me. Um, here's, yes. Oh, sorry. I don't know if I'm, so here's an installation view of the Kavi Gupta show. Um, and I'm just going to show you, this is a performance that was commissioned by the National Portrait Gallery in DC in 2019, um, to name another. And I'm just going to kind of show you through, but you'll see um, that print, um, They Teach Love.
teach love. He speaks to ancestors. They play endlessly. She makes space for us. Sorry, for time reasons, I'm going to move on. Um, so this is the, uh, the exhibition, um, When Fire is Applied to a Stone, It Cracks at the Brooklyn Museum. It's going to be up until July, or I'm sorry, early January. Um, this piece here is from 1904 by Charles Rumsey. And um, you know, it's very representative of sculpture of its time. Um, it's called The Dying Indian. When I started meeting with the Brooklyn Museum, this was a sculpture that sat in the back of the parking lot. Um, we couldn't even find it initially in the cataloging system. And um, the text behind it says, I'm gonna, I'm gonna run with every minute I can borrow, which is, uh, those are lyrics from a Roberta Flack song, To Love Somebody. And, um, and then the pattern is painted directly on the wall. The moccasins in the front here are all, um, you know, we don't know who made them. We don't know who they were made for. So they're anonymous and I placed them so that they were facing the sculpture. And I had um, commissioned a pair of moccasins for the sculpture. You can see them on their feet. Um, and the text I'm gonna run with every minute I can borrow are in the beadwork on the moccasins. And they were made by John Murray, um, who lives in Montana. Um, this is um, when you come in and you look to your left. This was a collection of objects from the collection that I feel like I have looked at for years in terms of learning about you know, process, materials, history, storytelling, color. Um, and this was the installation, uh, one of the views of the installation. Um, we're coming to the end here, but this, is, um, this was what I was telling you. I worked with Sarah Ortegon before, but um, this was the piece just before we went into quarantining um, commissioned by Times Square Arts as part of Midnight Moment where they offer artists the um, video screens in Times Square. And so um, we brought Laura um, probably about a year ago to shoot her in the studio, to video her in the studio. And then um, we created this video which is only two minutes and 50 seconds. This is only a minute long. This is the uh, minute long documentation
So um, the this is actually at the opening night um, when we first were able to see it um, live. And so Sarah, with the um, handprint across her face, representative of Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women's Movement, and um, and Sarah is a champion jingle dress dancer who I've worked with numerous times. You're offered about 70 monitors in Times Square. So the video is edited so that she multiplies and kind of fractures. And so at different points, you can have up to close to 200 images of her dancing over Times Square. And due to COVID, it was actually up through um, August. So this is a very recent piece. Um, it's titled Sentinel. And I just um, wanted to share these with you to kind of show where things have gone. Just to give you a scale example, um, jingles, glass beads, and tons and tons and tons of fringe. Um, This is also, this are from a show that was meant to open in May, but now we'll be moving um, to um, January. She was a beautiful boy. Um, and, and to me, these words are very complex. They are a lyric from um, a song by, uh, geez, now I'm forgetting. Um, it will come to me, it will come back. But it was, a, it was a song in the mid nineties. And I realized that these words I wouldn't actually say these words any longer because of the conversations around gender and, and transness and sort of how that has shifted. But I felt like it was something that I wanted to, to show to kind of trigger that conversation about why we wouldn't necessarily say these words any longer, or I wouldn't. Here's a new um, diptych drum piece. This is also quite large, a little bit larger. This is also a painting from the exhibition that will open in January, Bring Down the Walls, Let Them Fall, 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 which is a, um, a Chicago house track that at the time was talking about just sort of like racism and homophobia and difference. And this is before like the wall and um, that conversation in American culture. One foot in glory, one foot in hell. And these are um, combinations of acrylic on canvas and beadwork panels in custom frames. This is um, where we're gonna end. This is um, the current monument. Um, it doesn't really look like this right now because it's, it's had so much um, bleaching from the sun. We didn't expect for it to bleach so much. Um, there are four sides to the ziggurat. Um, this is a structure based off of um, a mound found within Mississippian culture. So respect indigenous land. Um, all, each of the four sides have their own saying on them. Um, and we will reconfigure this um, when it goes to the De Cordova next year. So this was the performance of Laura Ortman. Again, this is very short and this will be my last image. Um, I knew when the structure went up that I wanted to program. And like I said, Laura Ortman, Emily Johnson and Raven Chacon um, were the people who I knew I wanted to work with. Um, and this was the first performance and we'll be showing all the videos later, I believe in January, we'll be showing them. So with that, um, I am going to stop there. Um, let me see. Okay. I'll come and say hi. Thank you so yeah. much, Jeffrey. Yeah. Thank you. Um, that was that was great. I'm sure everyone out there 
if we could, we'd be clapping right now. <laughs> so um, I also got to figure out while you were talking that I think we graduated from grad school around the same time and came to New York around the same time. And so you're, this is one of the first artist lectures where I've actually gotten almost all the pop culture references you gave <laughs> because we were like in it at the same time. Um, and actually, and something that jumped out to me while you were talking, we got a lot of questions in. So I have a few different sort of disparate areas to cover in the next few minutes, asking you lots of questions. Um, but something that jumped out to me was when you were graduating from grad school, you mentioned that, you know, you were thinking about beauty and that was not really um, a thing that you were supposed to be thinking about at that time. And it was around the Dave Hickey essay on beauty, oh. right? And, um, and I remember thinking the same thing in grad school. I was also there for painting. and. Uh, and we got some a question in about that. And I wanna ask you that off the bat and sort of like go back to that moment when you were still learning and sort of those sort of foundational elements. Um, so the question was asking you to talk more about how you think about beauty. Um, obviously you're not thinking Kantian sublime, but something else. How do you approach aesthetics in your work? And I'm curious how that was informed and maybe how you had to break away from the theory when you were in school or did you have to break away from the theory from school? You know, I think, well, when I was an undergrad um, at the Art Institute of Chicago, and this would have been 92 to 95. Mm -hmm. And so while I was there, I also was hired as a research intern at the Field Museum to work on NAGPRA, which was the Native American Graves Repatriation Act. And I must have worked there about 30 hours a week. And, you know, I would go there and my job was to pull objects for visiting tribal delegations of elders usually. And so, you know, I'm pulling these insanely beautiful objects mm -hmm. that um, had so much, not only the content of like, let's say the collection cards and the acquisition notes and things like that, but to be able to talk to people and then to have the elders come in and include you in the kind of acknowledgement of the objects. So it was this huge thing and the objects were beautiful. You know, they're kind of undeniably beautiful. And then to go to the Art Institute the next day and have people have quite shallow conversations about how beauty couldn't be trusted and we shouldn't promote it because there's always another agenda and it's, it's this deceptive tool that's being used. And I could understand, yes, marketing uses beauty to kind of, you know, to, to, to guise lots of different agendas, I get it. But in and of itself, beauty is something, one that changes culturally. Um, it, the, the definition of beauty changes culturally, it changes throughout time. It just seemed like a really simplistic way. And it, you know, the, the, the 90s, and where we are now are sharing a lot of similarities in terms of these conversations around culture and identity. Mm -hmm. And I have to admit, I'm a little disappointed because it's not a simplistic didactic conversation to be had. It is, yeah, there's so many layers to it, you know? And there's, we're just, we're not gonna find the answers, especially when it comes into, and I'm not, I'm not saying that I'm not in support of major change. I'm in absolute support of major change. But the mechanisms that have to be developed in order for this conversation to happen are, um, that's, that just takes time and a lot of work, you know, it takes time and a lot of work. And so beauty to me is something that I actually like to think that um, from an indigenous perspective, beauty can be conceptual. And it's something that I haven't really been able to flesh out, but it's something that I keep returning to when I look at these beautiful objects and I think about the kind of stories that they tell or the kind of histories that they hold, you know, the beauty isn't just about the visual, the beauty is about also that narrative of community over generations, you know? Right, right, right. Um, I think that dovetails into one of the other questions about design actually, because I feel like where you're finding beauty and how you're interpreting beauty um, is very specific. Um, and someone was asking about, um, you, you said at, at the beginning of this lecture, something along the lines of how design can hold content. Mm -hmm. I feel like beauty also holds content. But um, so, so could you talk a little bit more about how design holds content for you? And maybe this dovetails into other questions about the political, but. Yeah. Well, for me, you know, growing up, um, Native American material cultures were oftentimes contextualized within 
ethnography, obviously natural history, but also the decorative. Um, oftentimes in kind of regional institutions, it would be in the decorative section. Mm -hmm. And um, over time, you learn that these objects have, they, you know, the decision making in terms of color, shape, format is really a strategy to tell stories. And so that to me was, I was like, you know, especially with indigenous geometric abstraction, I was like, these colors and shapes are representative of clans, of families. They're asking for protection. They're speaking to ancestors. They're showing to the sky. Um, why has there never been a show done with the distinction between that kind of geometric abstraction versus purely formal modernist geometric abstraction? To me, that's such an amazing show that could happen, you know? And um, so for me, that just became sort of like a way, and, and I think also, you know, what, whatever we've considered in the past as like craft or women's work or the decorative um, has always been dismissed as being frivolous and to be looked at, but not to be taken seriously. So it just kind of presented a challenge to be like, no, we're gonna, you know, make it at the scale to be seen as serious, or we're going to put the words on it that kind of make you focus you or do it on rawhide or, what is this kind of ability to, to signal that there is content in this and it can't be written off as just um, decoration? Right. Um, something when I was preparing to come and talk to you and to, to ask you these questions, um, I did some reading and um, everything that you're saying so far to me is, is reading, I mean, as you've used the word political a lot of times during the talk, and I know you've been asked about this a lot. And I, I want to dig like a little deeper into this because I'm curious if your thoughts have changed over the last seven months. Um, but there, in a, a few interviews, you've been asked about, are you an activist? Mm -hmm. People love asking that question these days. And, um, and you're definitely thinking very strongly about how you making the work that you make, choosing the materials you choose, referencing the things you're referencing, using the words you're using. These are all political, these are all political statements in the end, right? Um, and I, I, want, I want you to talk a little bit because I'm guessing a lot of the students out there and a lot of the people watching are wondering like, where, where does this, where does it cross the line into activism? What do you, how do you think about yourself right now? And this, and also next week's the election, so I've got to ask this. <laughs> like, how, how are you feeling right now about all that? Well, I, I guess um, I guess I would have never appointed myself as an activist because I look at other people who are doing frontline activism, you know, protests, frontline, putting themselves in the line of, of danger in a different kind of way. And I have not made those choices to do that. So I have partnered with those people. I have made sure that they know that I am there to support them in ways that I can. Um, I look back at a number of artists, primarily black artists who during um, civil unrest of the past have continued making purely abstract work. Um, they, didn't, they didn't decide to um, make work with slogans on it or you know anything that would immediately be seen as political activism and i'm so thrilled that that work exists because there's some there's a different kind of strength about kind of continuing on your trajectory you know and like i said i think if i had looked back at my work over the last seven or eight years and i was like oh my gosh you've just been making beautiful objects that had nothing to do with any of these conversations but I felt like it was more of an opportunity to go a little bit deeper and to think about and try to use that kind of muscle that I've developed to allow it to be in conversation with this moment. Having said that, lately people have begun to identify me as activism. And when I say, no, I don't identify as an activist, they're like, no, but you are. Um, and they're like, and so I'm happy to take that on. I don't think that I would have personally, I guess it's like within the larger definition of activism, it's like, I'm happy to be there to support you. If you feel like what I'm doing is activist and is, is, is an activist statement and it's in support of a movement or a cause, happy to be there, happy to, you know, for free. With the election coming up, you know, I've done billboards, we've raised money for local, for national, we've donated paintings, we've done ads, you know, it's like, um, and I do feel like that is a responsibility. Right, right. Yeah. 
Um, along these, this idea of choices, there have been a few questions about text. So um, I'm gonna read a few of them. One of them is, um, what are your thoughts about the interplay of visual art and text? What does text within your visual works do for you that text alone or visual work alone does not? That's from Laura. And then another one was um, from m a that I think could all be grouped together. Can you talk about your choice of using the English language where writing is present in your work? Um, and she could see why you're using English versus a language of the Cherokee or Choctaw, but she's curious why you're, why you're using that. Um, well, for me, language is always something that, you know, it's a very layered thing why I don't speak Choctaw. You know, and I think for many people who come from um, other cultures, like whose parents may be immigrated here, I, I know that there's a shared kind of narrative. You know, my parents, uh, my parents went to boarding schools um, where they were forced not to speak their language. My um, father grew up speaking Choctaw. My mother grew up speaking some Cherokee. Both of my grandfathers um, established, founded Indian churches in rural Mississippi and Oklahoma and would preach in their language. I think the experience of going to boarding schools for my parents probably made them make the decision to, to teach me English as my first language because their experience of it was racial exclusion. And that notion of acculturation is so drilled in through the boarding school system. Um, you know, my parents chose to raise me outside of um, a reservation community in Mississippi. Really, my father wanted to escape poverty. That's really the bottom line. And he wanted to give me opportunities that he felt were important. So that's who I am. That's my inheritance, right? I didn't really get to choose those things. I get to make choices about what I do with that inheritance. And I have never been a fan of wanting to sort of like go back to the way it was or to try to become traditional. I feel like I have been put here for a reason and I have to kind of move forward in that way. And language for me, I've only ever thought about using Choctaw language. It makes me uncomfortable knowing that I show primarily to a white audience. I feel like I would, it would be like almost giving into a fetishism or this kind of authenticity model about how authentic is Jeff because he uses or doesn't use Choctaw. I've arrived at 48 to use Choctaw now in an extremely limited way. And it's really because there is no English word for what I want to say. So I turn to Choctaw. And, um, and I'm just at the very beginning of that. Just at the, but I see it honestly as a respectful way. And I think I always knew that this day would come. There's a respectful way that I will, I will learn Choctaw, you know? So, um, so that's that answer to that. What was the first part of that though? It was about text and... Um, it was about just uh, using the, te the interplay of text and visual art, like using one or yeah. the other. It really had to do with the fact that, you know, I love pattern and I think there's storytelling and pattern and um, color and formal decisions. But when I would show my work, uh, all of the narrative was lost. You know, like uh, everybody was like, would just see it as formalism. So it was out of frustration. I was like, fine, I'm gonna put the words right on it. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna title and name my subjective experience so that you know what I'm talking about. Whether you agree with me or not is a different conversation, but it's my experience and I'm going to name it this. And it really just became that simple to me. And then I think it was about feeling and continues to be about a relationship with people looking at my work. Um, and, and that dialogue is really so important to me. It's how meaning happens, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and especially in terms of an artist's biography, you know, it's important. What, one of the reasons I started photographing people in the garments is because I want, if these garments go into museum collections, in that acquisition note, I want it to be said, Damien Dine Yaji was photographed in this garment. Damien Dine Yaji is a queer activist on the res in Arizona, founded RISE, um, created a fellowship for queer indigenous poets. Like that's the kind of points of connection that why it's important for me to one, have 
Damien wear the garment, but two, to have it noted and documented. So you ask the institution to note and document those types of things? We have it. We, I maintain my own archive. That's yeah. great. Yeah. That's great. Um, I think I have an institutional question here uh, from, I'll transition into that, from Kat. Um, they're asking, Jeffrey, your work means so much to me. I actually taught from your show at the Brooklyn Museum while I was an educator there, and I hold that experience close. So thank you for everything. My question is regarding how you reckon with some of the commercial aspects of the art world in terms of your own practice. I feel strange about the idea that some of your work could be purchased by white art collectors whose accumulation of wealth has contributed currently and or ancestrally to the exploitation and erasure of indigenous peoples. What are your personal thoughts on the place of your work in these collections? Mm -hmm. So you answered that slightly and I'm curious to hear more. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I really, um, I don't know, that's a, that's, that's, a, that's a long question to answer. I mean, I don't mean a long question, it's a long answer to the question. I, I grew up seeing the art world as um, a place for me after feeling like a weirdo in the rest of the world. You know, I was the teenager that was like, looking at magazines and paying attention to, you know, my parents made sure I went to museums. And I learned those spaces as being available to me and being a place where I could just, I could be gay, I could be, I could be brown and I could look at this work. And I felt like, I was like, oh, that's where I need to get to. I need to get to New York City as fast as I can because that's where I'm gonna be normal and get to move on. And um, it wasn't until my probably late 20s, early 30s that I was like, oh, wait, hold on a minute. No, like <laughs> the art world has a lot of problems and it, the art world is racist and the art world has homophobia and the classism is out of control mm -hmm. and I'm not a trust fund kid. And that was really heading me towards like depression, you know, and wanting to walk away from something that I truly love doing. Um, so that negotiation of trying to figure out like, but is it worth it? Like, is there something you can find in here that's worth it? And it really became about wanting to speak to those people who maybe like me were looking at these spaces and not seeing themselves specifically reflected. And I was like, okay, so in the world I live in right now, I think that that's worth it. If I can be in museum collections, if I can be the exhibition, if I can be the poster on the front of the building, if I can be the catalog in the bookshop, um, will I be that inspiring Keith Haring that Keith Haring was to me? You know, Obviously with, with digital media, and to me, it's actually what entered me into working with video was really being able to distribute beyond the institution, right? And so, I, you know, whether a cultural center on a reservation can or can't afford a work, pay for shipping, pay for insurances, we can send a file. And even if we had to buy the, the technical equipment to show it, we can do that, you know? So, um, and it's also to me very much about freedom. This is the only thing I've ever found that allows me to mix the worlds that I am so invested in and produce something that I think needs to exist in the world. Most people cannot afford to buy artwork. That is just the bottom line. Art is um, financially one of the most impractical things that I have ever learned about. But one of the things I love is that that impracticality almost in the making part of it doesn't mean anything. You know what I mean? It's just sort of like, what do you want to make? Like, what do you want to make? And can you, can you make it? Seeing the work go into institutions, um, it's mixed. I was crediting for a long time the institutions who collected me. And now that I've had the opportunity to have a lot of those conversations, I don't credit the institution any longer. I credit the individual who advocated to get my work into the collection. Because there are many people who can put forward an artwork to be acquired by an institution. And it has a long way to go from someone having, let's get a Jeffrey Gibson punching bag, you know, to suddenly, um, you know, it getting into the collection. It's, it's, but, but I also understand it's frustrating for artists because so few people get to be a part of those conversations. So that's all happened in the last, you know, five or six years. So. And, and I will say one other thing, one of the reasons why 
I maintain my studio the way that I do with this team of people, which is very expensive to do, um, is really because I feel that it allows me control and freedom that I don't work with any one gallery who knows every single thing I do. Like, I get to hold on to the kind of core DNA of, and no one gets to see it until I send it out into the world. Um, that there's so much, there's so much there, <laughs> so much there. And uh, something I was noticing while you were talking was that unlike a lot of other artist talks that I've seen, you were using the word we a lot yeah. and you were crediting a lot of the people who were in your photographs, who helped you um, uh, make a video, who helped you like produce different things. And I feel like that sort of attribution and that credit is, is something that I've, I'm seeing more and more when people are talking about the work that they do and, and recognizing the labor that's gone into it. There was something that I read about how you, um, you went from making this stuff on your own to, ha to having this studio and having this, this team. Yeah. And, and one of the reasons I think you gave in this interview was that you needed, to, you needed more time for experimentation and failure. And I'm, cur I'm curious about the relationship between those two things, having this team around and this failure, like what, is, what, is that, what does that look like? Because I think a lot of us are probably really interested in failure and we're also really interested in working collaboratively. So if you could talk well, about that. Yeah, I think in the beginning of your career and in the beginning of my career, you know, I was broke, had no money. Um, and you don't, you know, I was working sometimes when I was living in Brooklyn, I was working like 70 to 80 hours a week sometimes. I was working like, sometimes I was working seven jobs. And, um, and I would still come home and be like, I'm gonna paint tonight from 11 to 1 a.m., you know? But realistically, painting from 11 to 1 a.m., in retrospect, I'm like, what was I really hoping to accomplish in two hours after being completely exhausted with my brain full of other people's voices? And so, you know, there were different moments other than that, you know, maybe I did a residency or I was able to go away somewhere and like have some time. But for me, once I committed to being an artist, I was like, you know what, you have to prioritize this. You can't work 75 to 80 hours a week. You need a studio, you need time. And um, I also met lots of, I'm gonna say crazy artists in New York whose relationships burned out, who gave up so many sacrifices in hopes of them that they would be successful one day. And I was like, you know what? I'm gonna structure my life. I work Monday through Friday. I work 9.30 to 5.30. I don't work weekends. I haven't pulled all-nighters for more than a decade. Um, it was important for me to have a family. And so part of it was figuring out how to bring assistance in. I started with hiring per project, you know, especially if I was working with an institution, I would ask for a budget for in assistance. Um, then we went to three, then we went to four, then, you know, galleries were involved and I was able to pay more people. And now, also because I was working in handcraft and my love of handcraft is that feeling of tactile labor in the work and what it does for a viewer to be able to do that. I don't wanna rush it. I don't wanna cheat or any of that stuff on the quality of the material. And so the team allows me to um, hire people in here, which, you know, we've had people working here now for seven years, six to seven years. Um, and people who love doing handcraft. And it means that I get to, um, be involved in other projects. It means I get to um, kind of dip in and out of all parts of the studio. And then I have my own spaces. I might have a table in one room. I have my office, which I'm in right now. Um, and this is really where I get to generate ideas for new work. And again, like I said, I said numerous times, um, you know, I don't know what the finished work is gonna look like. So I have to know a clear starting point then we'll have somebody in the studio create that clear starting point and then we look at it and then that's what tells me what the next step is. We might have five or six of those things going on at any given time. And it, I trust everyone here and I respect them so much. So it's really like, it is like an extension and I do try to generate as much of a familial vibe as I can in the studio. 
Um, unfortunately, it's 630. I have questions about vulnerability and trust <laughs> and how you make ceramic heads and like your role in teaching. But unfortunately, it's going to have to be to, it's to be continued. Um, but, but before you go, um, I just love for you to, to, to say something that you're really excited about. I know a lot of things have been postponed. You've talked about that and some things are coming up and maybe something if we're all excited about seeing your next thing. Like where, sh what should we look at? What should we do? I just went to Socrates. You're still at the Brooklyn Museum. What, what, no. what well, the, the Brooklyn Museum show will be up through January. Um, the Wattis Institute commissioned a video project. I've been doing a lot of video projects during COVID months. Um, and that will launch publicly on their website, the Wattis Institute on the 30th of this month which is a video which is very much about the anxiety of this time. So it is slightly different for me. Um, and we're working on another video, which we worked with dancers and performers. I feel like performance and movement and sound have been really grounding for me during this time. Um, and so we worked with a number of people there. That will come about in December. Um, otherwise, I'll be doing, um, a show in New York City in with Sikma Jenkins in um, early March will be the next the next thing. And then the sculpture at Socrates will go to the De Cordova Museum just outside of Boston in, um, I believe we're looking at May and it will be totally different. We're I'm just in the process now of talking about um, how to readdress the surface and what kind of programming is going to happen. And I'll also be doing an interior exhibition in their, in their galleries in the building. That's great. This is so exciting. Um, I know lots of people have been writing in how much they love your work and how it's been so inspiring. So thank you so much for sharing with us tonight Absolutely. and answering all those questions. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank Thanks you all everyone. so much. Yeah. Bye.